All right, so previously we talked about Mr. Fraunhofer and the dark lines that he discovered while he was looking up at the stars. So we said that Fraunhofer is really given credit, at least for the first part of atomic absorption and emission, because he started to explain why these dark lines were not present. However, the full story did not stop there. That was only parts of the story that he was being able to provide uh, to the scientific community because other people had to get involved in order to fully explain what was happening. But Fraunhofer was the first person to make the step in that particular direction. Okay, so after Mr. Fraunhofer passed away at the age of 39, we get two more scientists called Kirchhoff and Bunston. And Kirchhoff and Bunston uh, happened around 45 years later. That's longer than the lifespan of Mr. Fraunhofer. So this did not immediately happen after Fraunhofer publishes some of his reports. There's a somewhat of a delay. All right, so what Kirchhoff and Bunsen did is that they took an element and they put it into a flame and they noticed that the flame was colored. Now, they were not the ones who discovered that, of course, but... This was the idea, or their launching pad. And they began to question, okay, well, if I put this element in the flame, I get this color. And I put this element into the flame, and I get this color. And then I put this one into the flame, and I get a completely different color. There's got to be a reason that this is happening. Why are different elements giving me different colors? And they called this emission. The flame is emitting a light. And this is somewhat the theory of what we now call atomic emission. We put an element into a flame. The flame gives me a color that we can then measure. And this measurement is called atomic emission. So they worked with some of these elements, and they recorded the colors that they were emitting off. What were they able to pick up in the wavelength regions? And they would make a recording, and they would log it. And finally, one day, they made a discovery. And they said, wait a minute, there's a strange coincidence that's happening here. When we talk about emission of light, we are recording these colors that they're giving off. However, when we look at the Fraunhofer lines, the lines that are dark, that are not showing up, those elements basically correspond to the absorption. There's got to be more to the story. And these two things, basically, what they discovered is that they are complements of each other. So, for instance, if I throw a piece of copper, copper pipe, into a bonfire flame, that copper will probably give off some light. It will emit a color that I will see, typically kind of greenish, sometimes bluish. If you're ever at a bonfire, throw some copper pipe in and see what happens. However, copper also absorbs. It absorbs particular light. And what they found out is that the absorption is very similar to what it emits. If it absorbs certain colors, then it will emit those colors, and vice versa. So these dark lines that Fraunhofer discovered, the dark lines were actually present because elements were in the solar system, 
and these elements were absorbing that particular light. That's why those were present. So in 1859 and in 1860, these two men published a set of papers. And they basically said that most elements have their own unique spectrum that could be used to identify that particular element. So their focus here was on the emission side. They related it to the Fraunhofer lines, but they were really focused on the emission side of things, not the absorption side of things. So 1859 and 1860, they finally get published. And they are published based on the fact that they took sodium in their laboratory and showed that sodium emitted light energy if you put it into a flame. And they recorded what those wavelengths were. And then they did a couple of other elements at the same time, not just sodium, but they proved that these elements were emitting different light energies as they were heated into a flame. This is what gave birth to the AE world. It was Kirchhoff and Bunsen. Now, eventually, they will relate it back to absorption. And they will say that the emission of the light is complementary to the absorption of the light. And that is the world of AA, or atomic absorption. All right, so here's Mr. Bunsen, and here's Mr. Kirchhoff. There you go, Kirchhoff. Uh, again, like I said before in the previous video, most of these pictures that you will see are of older men. And for the first time, Fraunhofer was a breath of fresh air because he was somewhat younger in his discoveries. But this is Mr. Kirchhoff and Mr. Bunsen. Now, of course, the field of AA and AE did not stop with them, all right? These were just a few more players that were involved in the process that allowed this discovery to happen. So, Wollaston came along first. Wollaston said they're dark areas that don't really know why. Fraunhofer was able to improve that concept and talk about specific dark areas that were present and started to explain why those were gone because they were getting absorbed. Then Bunsen and Kirchhoff come along and they basically say, well, not only are elements absorbing light, but if you take those elements and you put them into a flame and you heat them up and give them energy, they're emitting that light as well. Two parts to the same story cup half full, and cup half empty. Finally, what I would say in modern times, we get what we would call, I guess, the founder of the AA and AE instrument. And his last name was Walsh. W-A-L-S-H. Sir Alan Walsh. 1916 to 1988. Very current, very recent. Some of you were probably born in the 80s. I know I was. So in 1953, Sir Alan Walsh comes around. And this was absorption and emission was known for years. But Walsh wanted to capture this knowledge and he wanted to make it useful. He wanted to have a purpose, and he wanted it to improve laboratory technique. And he took the information provided in atomic absorption spectroscopy. All right, atomic absorption spectroscopy. Whenever I write atomic absorption spectroscopy, 
I'm going to abbreviate it as AAS, Atomic Absorption Spectroscopy. Uh, however, a lot of times, not just me, but there's another abbreviation for the abbreviation, and that's AA. They leave off the S because we understand that it's spectroscopy here. So, atomic absorption, AA. And Sir Alan Walsh wanted to take the AA field, and he wanted to convince someone to make an instrument. He was trying to make the argument that there was a lot of information that could be obtained if we had this proper equipment in order to do it with. And he wanted to take the instrumentation manufacturers, and he wanted to take all of the mechanics of what goes on here. And he wanted to make an instrument that he could then sell to a laboratory and have them perform AA analysis or AE analysis. Finally, in 1957, someone eventually took him up on the offer. And they said, okay, we will make an instrument for you. And the first AA instrument became available. Now, this instrument was nothing like what we have today in our laboratory, but it was the starting mod, mod, model, just like the vehicle back in the day as well. There's going to be improvements on it, but this was our first Ford model, you could say, in the laboratory when it concerns atomic absorption. What he said, and part of his argument, was that he was working in his garden and he said he looked down at his dirty boots and he took the knowledge of all atoms give off light energy and instead of measuring the energy that's given off why don't we measure the energy that is absorbed The reason that he makes this argument is that atomic emission was one of the ones that were heavily used during that time. And atomic emission was only really reliably good for eight to nine elements during the time that he made this argument. And that was it. So he said, well, wait a minute. We need to make an instrument that will measure the absorption pattern not the emission pattern. We know that the emission pattern is easier to measure because it's giving off light and it's easier to see. But we need an instrument that will measure the absorption bands, the Fraunhofer lines. If we can somehow make an instrument that will suit that purpose, then I think that we will be able to measure more metals and more elements throughout that time period. So he called this atomic absorption. Okay. Instrumentation manufacturers did not go for this during the time. They shot this idea down. And they said, no, we're not going to give you a machine. This is stupid. What we have is perfectly fine. Not a big issue at all. So he said, okay, well, I'll make a prototype. And if I make a prototype and show you that it works, would you take me up on my offer? And they said, maybe. So what Walsh did is that he took sodium. Again, sodium was a very common, simple substance to use. He built sodium as a trial element, and he basically sent sodium into a flame. Normally, this would give off energy and it would emit and this is what we would call atomic emission AE but Walsh said no 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 that's not what I want to do here what I want to do is something a little bit different I want to take sodium into a flame and I want sodium to go through the flame but I want to measure the absorption not the emission so what he makes in his prototype is a bulb that's made out of sodium 
and the bulb is going to go through the flame because it's got light energy with no sodium in it at all. And there's going to be a detector over here to the side. And this detector is going to measure how much of the light goes through the flame. And then Walsh said, then I'm going to put sodium in. And when I put sodium in, I'm going to see this flame that pops up in the light path. And the sodium is going to absorb the energy from that bulb. And the detector is going to see it. And it's going to reach it as a positive signal. So this was the starting platform. It was with sodium. But it quickly grew. Sodium was not the only element you could do this for. You can actually do this process for 65 or more elements on the periodic table. The only thing that you have to have is a bulb that matches what you're trying to measure because you're measuring the absorption. All right, so then he goes and he tries to sell it. And Mr. Walsh goes to these instrumentation companies and he says, guys, listen, I think I've got a better instrument other than atomic emission that we can take advantage of. I have made this prototype and it requires a light bulb. The problem is that you got to have a light bulb specific for what you're trying to measure, but... I think that we can measure up to 65 different elements on this machine as long as we have the proper bulbs in place. I think it's going to be more sensitive. I think we're going to be able to detect more metals. And I think it's going to improve our laboratory data. And the instrumentation manufacturer said, uh, no. And shoots Mr. Walsh down. But, you know, on the screen, I just said, 1957, the first AA became available. So eventually, they have to pick it up. 1953 is when all of this kind of started. So there for a couple of years, no one took it seriously. It was just a prototype. So what changes people's mind? Well, Walsh was one of them. What Walsh decided to do is he decided to make a make-it-yourself or do-it-yourself kit. And this was for an AA instrument. He assembled all the pieces together that someone would need in order to measure this. And he would send it to a laboratory and let them put it together and let them start using it. And then finally, what they report is that a young boy rushes into the hospital. And they don't really know what's wrong with him. He's going through severe convulsions. And no one knows why. The doctor scratched their head. The nurses scratched their head. Who knows what's going on at the time. But the hospital that this boy was sent to had a do-it-yourself AA. And the hospital staff finally said, well, let's take a sample of this boy's blood and let's analyze it on this AA instrument then. See what's there. And when they did that, they realized that this boy's magnesium levels were extremely low. That was all due to the AA instrument. So, of course, after that time, the doctors just had to give magnesium supplements and he was okay. But if it wasn't for that machine, what would have happened? So, Eureka, we have a use for an AA instrument. We were able to measure metals, in this case magnesium, in human blood and were able to report data. 
This is something that really couldn't have been done with the Tomica mission as easily or as well. But it doesn't stop here. Because in another time, in Japan, what we find out is that multiple people were getting poisoned. Go figure. And they were going to doctors and they were going to clinics and they really didn't understand what was happening to them. Guess what? A do-it-yourself kit AA was in a laboratory. And they did the same thing to these people as they did to this young boy down here at the bottom. They measured metal content in the blood serum. And what they found is that mercury was present in the water supply as well as elevated levels of lead. Again, it was AA that allowed this to happen. And if it wasn't for John Walsh and his push to try to get these instruments into a laboratory, who knows how long it would have taken back in the day. All right, so let's kind of take a look and get caught up with what's happening here. So here are the emission lines from the elements compared to the visible spectrum. And this is what started the AE field off, right? This is before John Walsh got into the picture. This was after Kerchief and after Bunsen. So here's hydrogen, and it emits some light energy that we can record. Here's neon. It emits light when you put it into a flame. And it has a different fingerprint, or what we would like to call barcode. Down here is iron. You probably can't see it fully. Uh, but iron was down there at the bottom. And iron emits a lot of different types of wavelengths when you heat it up and put it into a flame. So that's iron's barcode down here at the very bottom. All right, well, now we know that many different instruments have their own barcodes. Many different instruments or elements have their own barcodes. So here's the emission spectrum of almost all of the metals from the periodic table. And you can see that they're all different in some form or in some fashion. They are all unique. So if all of the emissions are different, and this is easy for us to see, then the complement absorption should also be different for every single element, and they are. Here's Mr. John, or Sir Alan Walsh. Uh, this is the guy who came up with the first do-it-yourself kit uh, in a uh, laboratory, and he was kind of the father of the AA instrument for that purpose or for that reason. And then here is Mr. Walsh in front of what we would call the first modernized atomic absorption spectrometer. And a lot of the basics are not different. They're still really what we use today. Uh, you see a flame chamber that's here in the center. You'll see some air and some acetylene gas intake uh, that will make the flame happen. Uh, it requires a light bulb, and it requires a detector. So all of the basics of the machinery are still present today. We just have it look a little prettier, and it, ha it looks a little fancier uh, compared to this one. That's more analog. Ours are more computer-driven nowadays. But that's the first A8 instrument and Mr. Walsh in front of it. So you can thank him for the journey that you're getting ready to embark on with the machine. And in the next video, we'll finally start talking about more theoretical concepts assigned to the instrument. So stay tuned. There's plenty, plenty more to come. Uh, so take a bathroom break. Get you some popcorn and come on back to the computer screen.